home. I have no home. This time we watched Season 4, Episode 23, Bride of the Monster. Podcast. I have no podcast. (laughs) You do, and we have to record it right now. But before we get to the meat of the episode, I guess, let's uh, have some of the sides. Let's talk about a little fallible news that's happening in the big world of MST3K, because there's a lot of it. Oh boy. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but the Mads just did an episode of their little show about the Beach Girls and the Monster. Did you get a chance to see it? It's sitting downloaded in my drive, but I haven't had a chance to see it. Do not take this as uh, as as a, uh, a, a sign that uh, that you shouldn't watch it. I'm excited to watch it. I'm just very busy. <laughs> yeah, same here. I finally caught up with the shorts from, from a month earlier. Um, people on our members-only Slack were very uh, enthusiastic about the movie and the riffing of the movie. And, of course, they are. I mean, uh, you know, as always... They're great, and I'm looking forward to finally seeing it. Yeah, it's it's the Mads. They always do a great job. It sounded like a really fun movie. I thought the uh, poster was absolutely zonkers. I think <laughs> it would be uh, it would be fun to to sit down and watch it when I get a moment. But as if that wasn't enough, they have put out a remastered version of the first movie they did in this little online streamathon thing they're doing, which is to say, Glen or Glenda. Now, is it the the film itself is remastered, or they simply removed the Zoom logo from their episode? I actually haven't watched it yet, but I believe they have simply replaced the footage of the movie so that it does not have the Zoom logo on it, no. Oh, okay, okay. But is it like a nicer copy of Glenn? I mean, it looked all right for Glenn or Glenn to stand yeah, so. Yeah, I think it's fine. I Hopefully it's a little nicer. I, I'm told it is a pleasanter watching experience by people who've seen it. Mm-hmm. That pesky Zoom bug. Yeah, exactly. I, I That Zoom bug really bugged me. Hey-o. Is that why it's called that? A bug? Yeah. Uh, I, I always thought that uh, that was there to annoy viewers on television whenever they'd have the network there, or in the case of Zoom, where it has its name there. Uh, so, yes, I think I think bug is appropriate. Yeah. Like a gnat at a picnic. Hmm. Listeners, if you know where bug for the name for the little logo that appears in the corner of a TV stream or whatnot, uh, where that comes from, write in. I'm too tired to Google right now. But I'm not too tired to tell you about the next movie the Mads are going to do, which is The Brain Eaters. Uh, How exciting. Uh, Is it the story of Timothy Leary? Ooh, no. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's the story of Bruno Vesoda. Oh. Based on a uh, Robert Heinlein novel, The Puppet Masters. Ooh, not to be confused with the log-running movie series, The Puppet Master. (laughs) Well, I, I guess. Actually, when I say it's it's the story of Bruno Vesoto, I mean, uh, he directed this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've seen him act, so to speak, <laughs> if yes. you want to call it that, in a few MST3K episodes. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he actually uh, he helmed this one. So uh, that's got to be good. And it's got Leonard Nimoy in it. Ooh, that is exciting. Yeah. yeah. It's from 1958. I hope it involves Leonard Nimoy doing his precious Australian accent, which he did on an episode of Mission Impossible back when he was on it, because it is the most bonkers thing I've ever heard. It's like, (laughs) have you ever, have you never met anyone from Australia? It is, uh, it's, it's sort of like an Englishman without a tongue. That's the best way I can describe it. That's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awful. So hopefully he does it in the movie. Meanwhile, on the other side of the great MST3K divide, Joel and friends have been doing a thing that they're calling Mindless Summer. Hmm. Now, they're doing the thing that they did a few months ago, a year ago? I have no idea anymore. Uh, where they're watching... Hey! They watched that, if you recall, and then they were they were joking over it. Yes. Glad to, ha- glad to have that one make a comeback. <laughs> Well, they did some other movies this summer. They've been doing Horror of Party Beach, Tormented, Bloodwaters of Dr. Z. They're going to do Catalina Caper soon and Codename Diamond Head. Hmm. Interesting lineup. 
Yeah, they're all streaming on YouTube. I don't know if you've had a chance to check out any of that. <laughs> this is how far removed I am because I've been so nose deep in other things. Uh, I uh, This is the first I'm hearing of it. <laughs> well, I caught a few minutes of Tormented, but I have to say, just like with the... Um, I'm I'm just not sure I'm into watching people watching an old episode of MST3K and occasionally joking. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I, I guess the theory was it kind of worked with season one where there weren't quite enough jokes in it. But I don't know. I, I guess, like, if you've seen the episode a million times and you just want to watch it with some of the new actors and such, then it's a good time. It's, it's nothing wrong with it, but it just didn't, just wasn't what I needed. If I, yeah. if I wanted to do that, I would just watch Tormented again. Yeah, yeah. It's already like watching the movie with friends. I don't need more friends on top of that. I have enough friends. Yes. You already have, you know, an excuse to watch it because we'll do it eventually. And then you get to podcast with a friend. Yeah, that is also true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Okay. One other thing that's going on. Mary Jo has a new monthly Twitch thing happening starting on Tuesday the 24th called the Mary Jo Peel Show. Now this I did uh, I did see mention of. That's exciting. I don't know what it's going to entail. Is it is it also a riffing show? No. I don't think so. Oh, okay. I don't know. The poster is calling it a new comedy live stream series to help you forget the world is on fire. Okay. Well, I mean, that's uh, that's needed as ever. I don't know. I'm excited. It's lovely to see Mary Jo Peel back. Yes, because we all, we really wanted to see that Renfair show that she and Trace Beaulieu were doing that, you know, almost happened. And it was like, <laughs> oh, man, I, I wanted to see that. It looked interesting. Yeah. I, I, I had a fun time sort of going into whatever that weird thing she was doing on her YouTube channel was. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. It was kind of delightful in that small way that Mary Jo can be really great at. <laughs> anyway, all of that to say, lots and lots of things happening in the Mistyverse. I mean, I'm sure Rift Tracks is doing something, too, but they don't write. So, no. <laughs> But we should get talking about today's episode, Bride of the Monster. An Ed Wood classic. This time we watch Season 4, Episode 23, Bride of the Monster. But first, a short, Hired, Part 1. Jimmy's a new hire at the Chevrolet sales lot. His boss gives him a lot of binders full of facts about the new Chevys of 1941. But Jimmy isn't very successful at making any sales. His boss worries. What's with these kids today? Why don't they have the moxie to make sales like he did back when he was a new hire? The boss spends an afternoon sitting on the porch with his father drinking lemonade, complaining about the kids today, and his dad reminds him that when he was a new salesman, his boss gave him lots of hands-on training. And on this cliffhanger, we end our tale. For now. And now for our feature presentation. We open with two hunters seeking cover from a rainstorm, where they encounter a spooky old house. The home is occupied by Dr. Eric Vornoff, a mad scientist played by Bela Lugosi. The hunters ask for shelter, but are scared away by Vornoff's assistant, Lobo. Wait a minute, an assistant named Lobo? This could only be the work of Tor Johnson. As for the hunters, one is killed by Vornoff's giant pet octopus, and the other is abducted by Lobo for Vornoff's experiments. The experiment is unsuccessful, and the remaining hunter dies. The hunters are the latest victims in a rash of disappearances in the area. Police Captain Robbins, played by Harvey B. Dunn, is confronted by this film's Lois Lane, Janet Lawton. Robbins denies the rumors that there are monsters lurking about the swamp area where Vornoff lives. With no help from the police, Lawton heads to the swamp herself and is nabbed by Lobo. He seems fixated on her, and especially her Angora beret. At the creepy old house, Vornoff hypnotizes her in order to keep her on ice until he's ready to experiment on her. Professor Vladimir Strosky, a self-described authority on prehistoric monsters, comes to the police to investigate these monster rumors. Strosky agrees to meet a police lieutenant named Craig out in the swamp. Craig, who happens to be reporter Janet Lawton's fiancé, arrives first and spots Lawton's abandoned car. He leaves the scene to report her disappearance to Captain Robbins. Vladimir Strosky arrives at Vornoff's place on his own. Strosky, it turns out, is a citizen of the country that exiled Vornoff just because he wanted to create radioactive giants. Vornoff's not having it, and Strosky is tossed to the octopus by Lobo. Moving on, Craig arrives on the scene, and Lobo, struggling with his crush on Janet, saves her and subjects Vornoff to his own experiment. Miraculously, Vornoff doesn't die and is transformed into a super being, which mostly consists of Bela Lugosi's double wearing platform shoes so he can tower over Tor. Lobo bites in a battle between himself and Super Vornoff. Can anything stop Super Vornoff? Yes, a rock. 
Craig launches a boulder at him, and the superpowered professor is knocked into the swamp with his killer octopus. Surveying the carnage, a recently arrived Captain Robbins offers this moral to Vornoff's tragic story. He tampered in God's domain. The end. Meanwhile, on the satellite of love, Crow's sleeping. Oh, let's use Cambot to peep in on his dreams. Tom, dressed in a candy striper's outfit, helps out, and then shows up in Crow's dreams, dressed in a candy striper outfit. Awkward! Except Tom kind of likes the outfit, and Crow thinks he looks cute in it, so hey, maybe it's good after all. Down in Deep 13, Frank's been bad, so Dr. Forrester puts him in a tough love seat. Thankfully, the tough love seat has room for two, so they can engage in a, a kind of couples therapy. Joel shows his variation of Faith Popcorn's trend-tracking popcorn report, the Microwave Popcorn Report. Just zap it, and you'll get fresh new trends faster than ever before. After some movie, Joel and the bots present Hired the Musical. It's, it's just delightful. At the halfway mark, Crow complains that the monster in this experiment isn't that scary. They think about other seafood monsters, and then olive loaf monsters, and then dried beef monsters, and then and then they try to remember what they were even talking about. And after some more movie, Tom tries to imagine a world with no advertising, and Crow, dressed up as Willie the Waffle, shows them the nightmare world without waffle, I mean without advertising, which turns out not to be that bad. Anyway, commercial sign. And after the movie's all over, Joel and the bots help Cambot re-edit the film by collectively playing Bell Lugosi during the climactic final sequence. This mostly involves making some big, big faces. And then there's a letter from a viewer in Iceland. We end with a quick shot of Dr. F as Lugosi chasing Frank as Tor Johnson in one of the most upsetting bald caps you'll ever see. The end. <laughs> Wow, this is it. This is uh, MST3K tackling uh, a classic. Oh, man. Let's just start first by talking about that bald cap. <laughs> did you find it? Did you find it as viscerally upsetting as I did? Uh, yeah, I think because I, I, I had um, a viscerally upsetting bald cap experience in my own life where in my first year of university, I tried going out to a Halloween party dressed as Donald Pleasance, and it just looked like I had a condom on my head. It was awful. <laughs> Do pictures exist? Uh, they have all been burned. Oh, uh, well. Did you manage to have a little sort of spit curl of flesh in the front of your bald cap? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. Because that was the really upsetting part. <laughs> it was a hysterical joke, but it was really, ooh, ooh, ooh. it was really creepy. <laughs> uh okay okay um this is a very good episode it's got a lovely short that's very funny it's got a classic movie that you don't need to watch riff but you certainly aren't gonna cry about watching it rift mm -hmm. and it's got some pretty great sketches uh what's not to love about it i uh of of note in uh in the episode uh there's the the things that made me laugh the most um were uh moments in the sketches one is a little bit of physical acting by joel that is extremely funny uh, i don't know if you caught it but during the hired part where it goes to tom's song zeros uh joel just sits in the corner and like a theater actor who is still on stage uh but is not meant to take away any attention he just bows his head and remains completely silent <laughs> yes, and yes. it's like that's so funny and so <laughs> accurate um that that really made me laugh and i i i don't know if i caught that the first time i watched it but like i i certainly forgot about it and, and <laughs> it made me laugh all over again and i absolutely loved like the no advertising sketch is is i think the number two sketch obviously the number one is hired the musical uh um, I really loved no advertising, and uh, I was delighted by uh, the line. Again, perfectly delivered by Joel, but uh, again, just a biting line. It's like, I was looking for something from the mind of Billy Crystal, but I don't know where to turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But also the one where they like try to come up with the monsters. It It's a perfectly okay sketch, but at the end of it, when they can't remember where they started, and they're just like, um... <laughs> I think you were talking about dried beef. I was like, no, I definitely wasn't talking about that. I, there's just something about the way that that sketch just fizzles out, which is delightful as well. Yeah. Well, this is this is it. We have 
just great chemistry all around in in the what little of the mads we see and Joel and the bots just uh, are just kicking it on the saddle. I love it's it's so much fun. Everyone's firing on all cylinders in season four. It's such a good season. Yeah. And I mean, I want to say it, it's interesting doing this immediately after the last episode because, you know, this is a Ed Wood film. Ed Wood famously liked to wear women's clothing to relax himself. Mm hmm. And they make a bunch of jokes about this throughout the course of the movie. The jokes didn't seem near. I mean, the jokes simply weren't nearly as bad as no. the jokes <laughs> in the previous episode we looked at. Um, but they also did some things that maybe changed the context of them, including the opening sketch where you've got Tom feeling a, a little bit uncomfortable and ashamed of being dressed up in a nurse's outfit, a candy stripers uniform, right? A traditionally female outfit. And yet he feels kind of okay in it. And then Crow thinks he's kind of cute in it. <laughs> and yeah. like, it all resolves really nicely. And I was like, okay. So like, even if they are playing with some of the sort of, oh, that's inappropriate or, oh, that's kind of weird. They're like, oh no, actually, you know what? Maybe it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I don't like the only joke that I remember is for, from like, cause I remember there being like several references to, uh, to cross dressing throughout the episode. Uh, but the only one I remember is the only one that really made me laugh, even though like none of them are, I don't think any of them are groaners. None of them seem mean spirited. Like none of them seem like you should be ashamed and hate yourself if you like this, uh, like that. Um, let your freak flag fly as MST3K usually tells you. Um, but there's one that made me laugh and it's actually Janet Lawton's first appearance. And just because it's like, it's the first one we see in the movie, it's like immediately someone pipes out with, Hey, it's Ed Wood. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> And that made me laugh. It could be, given some of his other movies. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. They they didn't let it go so easily. They were a little too into it. They were a little weird about it. But it also wasn't at all the worst thing. I don't know. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, I guess. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, just it's interesting to compare the two. Um, what else? We've also got a special note here from listener Beth. Say, that sounds familiar. Listener and once and future host, Beth has a little note because uh, she got so excited when she heard we were going to do this episode that she had to uh, say a few words. Mm. Uh, Adam, would you do the favor of, of reading Beth's note to us? Absolutely. And do it in the voice? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> it was the summer before I started high school, and our family had just moved into a new house. During one of the many tours of the new digs we gave to friends and family during that time, I turned on our TV and selected a random channel to show some kids close to my age our gigantic C-band satellite dish slowly lurch into position. It landed on one of our new subscription channels, Comedy Central, and our TV blinked onto what appeared to be an off-brand kids' puppet show. I was just about to move the dish again when one of the puppets started having an erotic dream about the other one. I burst out into confused laughter. Who is this made for? As the MST3K crew moved into the theater and started riffing on the equally perplexing 1950s short Hired Part 1, I abandoned my hosting duties, delighted by the very concept of snarking on old black and white schlock. Why hadn't anyone done this before? And why was the involvement of puppet robots on a spaceship so integral to the formula? Two hours later, the show was over, our guests had left, and my parents were giving me a lecture on gracious hosting. <laughs> but it was worth it. I knew I had found something special. Over the years, I would discover many episodes that were much funnier and closer to my heart than Bride of the Monster, but I still catch myself distractingly crooning, come on and have some lemonade, 30 years later. <laughs> oh, that's such a nice story. Yes. And, you know, yeah, hosting responsibilities are important, but this was your future education at stake here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something clearly much more important than uh, impressing the kids with your satellite dish, and that is watching Pardon My Zinger. I mean, MST3K. <laughs> And I mean, those kids should have stuck around and watched too. It would have been good for them. Yeah, they they would have been uh, uh, perhaps starting their own podcasts. Yeah, they would have had the moxie to sell some more Chevrolets at the very least. Oh, certainly, certainly. And uh, perhaps take an interest in calamari. So this is, of course, written and directed by Mr. Edward D. Wood Jr. This is... The first movie that we're covering that was directed by Ed Wood. We talked about him in episode 50, which was on The Violent Years, which was written by Ed Wood. So long ago. But this is the first time we get to actually tackle one of the movies that he directed that's on this show. Mm. And I mean, what a good one. <laughs> what a good one. 
yeah, this is this is one of those cases where, uh, like a handful of movies like Puma Man and uh, and a handful of others, it's like this is entertaining enough to watch on its own. Yeah, have you watched it on its own? Yes, uh, Brian the Monster is a lot of fun. The all, all the MST3K crew really has to do in this episode is bunt <laughs> 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 because the, the, there's so much entertainment on display that you don't have to do a whole hell of a lot. And you know, I would say that this is a good episode. It's not necessarily in my top ten, but uh, yeah, it's like it, the, the charms of Ed Wood are all on display here. This is this is probably uh, I haven't seen Plan Nine in a few years, so I'd, I'd have to go back. But this is probably my favorite of the Ed Wood monster movies. The best Ed Wood movie is obviously Glenn or Glenda. Oh, yeah, easily. Yeah. Of the monster movies? I, yeah, I know. I think this one has to be. Although, now that I think about it, I'm not 100% sure I've actually watched it unmisted. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I should. I, I kind of wanted to for this you know, before we recorded, but but I didn't get I didn't have a chance to. I ended up watching Ed Wood again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's also a wise choice. It was not the worst choice i ever made yeah i mean i don't know ed wood is really great because although he is sort of notorious for being one of the you know quote unquote worst film worst directors ever Mm -hmm. which obviously not really (laughs) no i mean a worst filmmaker would be contemptible whereas ed wood is always a delight yeah well i haven't seen the later stuff but (laughs) but the main ed wood films one that he's most remembered for glenn or glenda jail vade pride of the monster plan nine the sinister urge maybe night of the ghouls maybe uh you know those are all those are solid yeah and you could watch them like they're a good introduction to like just sitting down and watching a bad movie i think oh absolutely and i think that's i think that's probably why he got his reputation as the worst filmmaker ever ever made because he's the most accessible bad filmmaker yeah, there, there, there's so much charm and delight in, in in this movie, and and like actual good moments, right? Like Glenn or Glenn is an actually good film. Yes, and it it it's it's genuinely moving. It's like I I, I have to say that it's genuinely moving, and it's also insane. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's got a lot to offer. It's 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 complicated art. And Bride of the Monster, I mean. We'll talk about it a bit more later, but it has that magnificent speech by Bella, the home I have no home speech. And it's like, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's actually a good piece of writing. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe not when he gets to his like, and with radioactive super beings at the end. Well, it's like, know, maybe I mean, that's a bit much. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's a good moment and like Bella acts really well with it. And like the music comes in and it's perfectly scored and it's, it's, it's all great. Um, Jailbait has some weird fun to it, and Plan Nine I've always found kind of boring, but I need to rewatch it at some point. But see, that's just it. It says like Plan Nine. I uh, I first saw in a theater with a crowd, so it was amazing. People were throwing paper plates, people were riffing the movie, and we were just howling along with the dialogue. But then, then I, I remember watching it on my own and, and being like, oh, there are some slow bits here between the amazingly funny moments. Like, you get why it's so notorious, but those moments aren't as uh, aren't as frequent as you hope. That was my memory of it, watching it on home video kind of on my own later as a lark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I mentioned the movie Ed Wood that Tim Burton made around 94, I believe. Mm-hmm. It is so rare for us to have a, you know, proper feature film that involves the making of one of the movies that we get to do. Yes. Uh, uh, that's why I'm looking forward to watching a little film called the creep behind the camera, which is all about the guy who made the creeping terror. Yes. Yes. I am excited about that when we get around to that one as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, Ed Wood, the film is a fable, right? Like it's a, it's a love letter. It is a glorious story. It is not historically accurate in many ways. No. Sadly, Bella Lugosi apparently didn't curse like a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently the real Bella was quite genteel. Yeah, and apparently they didn't actually have to steal the octopus that stars as the uh, monster in today's movie. Apparently. Apparently they did just rent it and forget to bring the motor, so that's why people had to, you know, pretend like they were moving the arms and being attacked by it. Which is nowhere near as good as a story. Please believe in Ed Wood the movie. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely believe it. Yeah, also, like, he didn't get frustrated in the middle of filming Plan 9, go out and run into Orson Welles. <laughs> Play 
played by Vincent D'Onofrio. Well, partially. He's also played by Maurice LaMarche uh, through The Voice. Oh, I was wondering about that. Okay, I was trying to look that up because I was like, this sounds so much like The Brain. Yes. <laughs> this has to be The Brain. I was like, okay. Apparently Vincent D'Onofrio actually has a better The Brain slash Orson Welles than I realized. But, but no, it was a voice dub. Yes, it's a it's a voice dub. Um, Maurice Lamarche it, does a killer Orson Welles. Um, I'm always reminded of his great uh, bit on the uh, beloved but sadly uh, too short lived show, The Critic, in which they watch an Orson Welles commercial for frozen peas, uh, <laughs> and he says it's like they're filled with country goodness and green penis. Wait, that's terrible. <laughs> 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 Such a good bit. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Um, but of course, one of the one of the glorious things about Edward the movie is that it really catches the sense of you know the, this is all just a bunch of weirdos and freaks who are you know going to hang out together and and put on a movie because one person really wants to, and it's like, well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> And it also, uh, like, it, it, it sort of, I think, through Ed Wood, I think it communicates to, you know, the audience who would potentially, like, potentially, if you're if you're not sure what an Ed Wood movie would be, you know, are you seeing a sad story? Are you seeing a, a story where you're supposed to, like, laugh at these hapless dopes? Um, it, it, it humanizes them, just like with the way that it takes Ed Wood's self-proclaimed Angora fetish uh, and, and shows it to be, it's like, this is a totally normal part of him that that makes him happier. And I think that scene is key to like getting people to kind of lighten up and go, it's like, you know, all these people are just trying to be happy. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful movie. It is a, it is a really good movie. It is a shame that uh, Dolores Fuller, uh, the girlfriend at the beginning of the movie played by Sarah Jessica Parker, mm-hmm. who appears very briefly in part of the monster was supposed <laughs> to have the main female lead, but got <laughs> passed over by, uh, for someone else who, uh, in the movie, Edward thinks is going to, uh, fund the whole thing. Uh, Loretta King, the actor, uh, who got that part denies that she ever made such a claim. And the movie kind of makes it specifically like uh, a confusion rather than go down one way or the other about what actually happened. Um, but anyway, she ended up playing the lead, and there's <laughs> just one little scene in a hallway <laughs> with Dolores Fuller. The movie makes it look like she just couldn't handle the freaks in it and, and sort of runs off and wasn't very supportive of Ed Wood, and that's not at all what <laughs> happened. No. She was, a, she was a much better, cooler person than that, but, you know, it makes for a good movie, I guess. It is unfortunate when you fictionalize things like that or, or make them more into like uh, fables about about how the world could be that, that sometimes people who don't deserve it get their reputations tarnished a bit. Yeah, that's true. It is a shame about Dolores Fuller because, you know, she certainly comes across as very, um, a very calm and kind person. And, and she seems to look back even fondly on those days. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Have you read that uh, book from? Oh, it was from a while back. It's from the '90s, I think, or maybe even the late '80s, where they like it's an interview book with all of Ed's crew. Oh, I read uh, a book. I forget the name of it, but I, I read a book that was so, almost like a. Um, it was done kind of oral history style. Yeah, yeah that's the one. That's the okay. One. Yes, that's the one I've read. I don't. Hopefully, I'll have the name of it in the show notes because I can't remember it. I read it when I was a kid, and it's been a while. I don't have a copy of it, but but sure enough, great book uh, to read because as as the movie Ed Wood makes clear, even if it's a fictionalized account, the life of Ed Wood is as entertaining as an Ed Wood picture, which is to say, very entertaining. <laughs> now, have you seen the sequel? To Bride of the Monster, Night of the Ghouls. Night of the Ghouls. Uh, I have seen Night of the Ghouls, but it's been so long. <laughs> um, I remember uh, getting a, a, um, a tape from the local video store. I think it was Jumbo Video and that had this like wonderfully like lurid, colorized uh, uh, art on it and uh, like kind of caricaturing um, the cast. But it's been so long that I don't remember much of it. Yeah, I haven't seen Night of the Ghouls. I'm I'm wondering how how it compares. And I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I I wouldn't be able to answer just because it's like I saw it so long ago. Like I was about uh, like 13. Oh um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So so it's like uh, 
dim memories dim memories on the one hand it doesn't have bella on the other hand it does have chris kreskin oh sorry i was about to say kreskin not kreskin chris <laughs> kreskin's very different <laughs> the other thing is while we're talking about ed wood um have you uh well first off have you seen any of the sort of later monster nudie films <laughs> well the trouble with the nudie cuties is that i'd be sitting around waiting for tor johnson to show up does he show up no no he died like before he started making those right exactly none of them like where where are the edward regulars that i've come to love uh well well i haven't seen them either they're a bit harder to come by but i guess i haven't really been looking and you know i think the the fact they're harder to come by sort of speaks to the fact that it's like even among edward diehards these don't live up to his great works yeah yeah i tried at one point to read one of his novels oh wow (laughs) uh yeah I remember reading a nonfiction book by him. What? Uh, yeah, there, there's like a book by him about the business. Oh. Yeah. And that one is mostly, uh, you can tell that Ed Wood is very bitter, but he keeps throwing references to Angora in there. <laughs> and that's the only <laughs> charming part about it. The one that I read was called, I believe, Killer in Drag. Hmm. And I say read. I read like four chapters. It's really exhausting, as you might imagine, from <laughs> Edward's prose style. It it bleeds over from uh, from how his scripts are written. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, you need to, you need some, uh, an actor of Bella's quality to liven that up. I feel like Edward is a good case of the sort of person that you might want to become a completionist of, and then you start digging at those corners and you're like actually i'm good <laughs> yeah you know his uh, his important works are the only are, are important for a reason and, and leave the rest at bay so the bots are not too excited about this movie's monster what did you think about our big octopusy friend i mean a giant octopus in a swamp is unique and original it's like it's something i haven't seen in a movie so it's kind of fun. I think uh, uh, Joel and the bots are mostly uh, reacting to the fact that uh, it's uh, just a, a mixture of puppet and unrelated octopus footage. Yeah, stock footage and not very convincing puppet that don't match up at all, but that's okay. Edward trusts you to have suspension of disbelief. <laughs> and you know what? He was right to do so. <laughs> are you a friend or foe of the octopus? I suppose, reluctantly, I have to say foe, not because I object to them, but because I've eaten so many. <laughs> oh, now, that's dangerous, you know. Well, because of, the, because of the ink patch, I might get inked? Nope. Because uh, each year, apparently, about five people or so die from eating octopus. It's worth it. From eating live octopus, anyways. Oh, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm weirded out enough by the uh, the dead octopus that gets the uh, the juice thrown on it and starts wriggling around like it's alive. That's too much for me. That's true. Um, yeah, I know the suck- suckers, I guess, get stuck in the throat and people can't dislodge it. And then apparently there are signs up in, in certain octopus-consuming parlors uh, th- encouraging you to please chew. For the love of God, chew like your life depends on it. Oh, God, I just, I don't think I'd be able to eat something that's alive. It's just too much for me. Now, I've never had octopus at all. Um, They don't seem pleasant, but uh, you seem to be a fan. To quote George C. Scott from the film Exorcist 3, it's a tasty fish. I have nothing against it. (laughs) All right. Um, Does it bother you that, like, they're kind of pretty smart (laughs) and you're eating them? Uh, Well, I mean, the same is true of pigs. That's very true. And the same is true of the delicious dolphins that end up in my cans of tuna. Yeah. <laughs> same is true of all those dogs they used to make hot dogs. hey In fact, octopuses have about as many brain cells as dogs do. Hmm. I don't know if all dogs have the same number of brain cells, because dogs vary a lot. But then again, so do octopuses. So I don't know where this statistic I found on a, on a really reliable uh, website uh, it it actually was a relatively reliable website, but I don't know. It was a little it was a little vague, saying that both octopuses and dogs have the same amount of neurons. Hmm. I um no. I I suppose that this means that like dogs, all octopuses go to heaven. They certainly can get into places they're not supposed to go. I'll tell you that much. That makes me like them. I was watching a little bit of footage of an octopus who was, I guess, hanging out where a guy would catch crabs, and crabs are dumb (laughs) so traps for crabs don't have to be very clever they basically have to have a hole in them because crabs can't figure out where that hole went 
And <laughs> so they get stuck inside cages that they could actually walk out of if they were people, let's say. Um, octopuses that are much larger can climb into these holes and eat all the crab and then slurp right out and <laughs> be perfectly fine. See, that's exactly what I would do as an animal. So in some ways, they can relate to the octopus. Let's see. What else is cool about octopuses? They they know how to use tools. Mm. They can open uh, pill bottles that have child safety mechanisms on, which some grandmas can't even do. So Wow. An octopus is better than your grandma. Some grandmas. Your grandma may vary. Um, also, the octopuses, uh, here's a fun thing. About two-thirds of their brains are spread out amongst its various arms. Oh, interesting. They have sort of little local brains, and then the main center brain is in charge of them, but they all have a certain amount of autonomy. Also, the the main part of their brain is shaped like a donut, which seems fun. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I remember that. No, I mean, octopuses seem like cool creatures. And uh, and they can remember people and uh, hate them. All right, that's why I should perhaps not go near an octopus. They'd know, they'd know how many of their kind I've slain. I like that they've done tests on this where they've had two, you know, like <laughs> aggravated octopus a- aquarium workers, and one of them would feed it and the other one would poke at it with a stick. <laughs> and after a while, it would like clearly know which one was which, even though they were basically the same shaped people and wore the same outfits. Hmm. And it was very nice to one of them and very squirty to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, those are some cool things about octopuses. Uh, I don't know. uh, Who's your favorite octopus? Well, I uh, would say that there is a video that I saw on Reddit in which uh, a girl had a uh, a baby octopus in her hand and immediately, like, latched onto her and she had trouble ripping it off. (laughs) And I was like, that's the spirit. Go get him, champ. Exactly. You kind of have to be on the octopus's side. Always. Um, there was Paul the Octopus. Mm, I don't know Paul the Octopus. Oh, you might remember Paul the Octopus. He was uh, very good at predicting World Cup games. Okay. He was an octopus. They put out two bowls of food with the different flags for the different nations. And in the 2010 World Cup, he was correct, I think, every time? Hmm. I think so. The Punxsutawney Pete of the World Cup. Or Punxsutawney Phil. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, octopuses tend not to live very long, so uh, he didn't make it to the next World Cup. Oh, Yeah, it's unfortunate. Hey, everybody, it's time for the, the Shadow 13. 13. It's time for the Shadow 13. 13 short facts about today's episode, Bride of the Monster. Go, Chris, go! Joel's Invention Exchange is Microwave Faith Popcorn. As Joel more or less explains in the episode, Faith Popcorn founded a company, Brain Reserve, that gets hired by other companies to figure out what trends will affect them. So, for example, she's the one who told Coca-Cola that bottled water was going to be a big thing. A lot of her predictions have not quite come to pass, but if you want to spend a lot of money on some advice that may or may not pan out, well, you know who to call. Microwave popcorn was first invented back in the 1940s, but its popularity really popped off in the 80s. As microwaves became more ubiquitous, popcorn became trendy as a diet food, and shelf-stable butter substitutes were developed. The earliest commercially available buttery microwave popcorn had to be refrigerated. We get a return of Crow as Willy the Waffle, who, as the show points out, first appeared in Season 3, Episode 17, The Saga of the Viking Women and Their Voyage to the Waters of the Great Sea Serpent, which we covered in Episode 91. And of course, Willy's whole no-advertising shtick is based on Coily from the short A Case of Spring Fever from 10th Season Episode Squirm, which we covered back in Episode 67. Upon seeing the title for today's short, Joel asks... Hey, isn't that the John Belushi biography? (laughs) Wired, Bob Woodward's book on the life and death of John Belushi, is seen as a little crass and exploitative these days. But that's nothing compared to the little scene film adaptation of Wired, which ends with Belushi, played by Michael Chiklis, pumping quarters into a pinball game. Why? If he wins the pinball game, Belushi will be brought back to life. Yes, really. Early on in the short, Tom quips, Hello, wall. Hello, Walls was an early 60s country hit for Farron Young, but it was written by Willie Nelson. The song is about a guy whose darling left him, and now he's so lonely he's talking to his walls, his window, and his ceiling. It's like a depressive goodnight moon. According to co-writer Alex Gordon, Bride of the Monster was originally titled The Atomic Monster, before Ed Wood changed it to Bride of the Atom, and well before it was given its present title. As for Gordon's assessment of the film, he said... 
Eddie rewrote the Atomic Monster and made a very low-budget picture vaguely based on it. Tony McCoy, the star of Bride of the Monster... Well, okay, if this movie stars anybody, it's Bella and Tor. But the leading man type featured in Bride of the Monster is played by Tony McCoy. McCoy's not much of an actor, which is why his only other credited film and TV work consists of a bit part in a movie called Naked Gun, once again not the Leslie Nielsen one, and an episode of Rin Tin Tin. Why Tony McCoy? His father, Donald, who owned a meatpacking plant, was the film's producer and insisted Tony be the lead. He also insisted that the movie end with a nuclear explosion, so not all his ideas were terrible. Anyway, of Tony, Ed Wood has this to offer. McCoy just couldn't come across with dialogue. He was the worst I ever had. (laughs) As mad scientist Bella straps a guy to a table and starts flicking switches, the guy has a question, and Joel has an answer. What are you doing, Tony? You're going to be Myra Brackenridge. So this is a complicated one. Myra Breckenridge is a 1968 novel by Gore Vidal, later made into a critically despised movie. The novel was scandalous at the time because its sexually liberated heroine, out to destroy traditional manhood and realign the sexes, turns out to be a trans woman. But here's the unexpected connection. Gore Vidal took the name Myra Breckenridge from actor, drag queen, and socialite Bunny Breckenridge, who is perhaps most familiar to our listeners for playing the alien leader in Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space. In other words, Bill Murray from the Tim Burton Ed Wood biopic. Crow makes a joke about Tilly, the spunky file clerk, saying, It's Wilhelmina Demarest. William Demarest is a vaudevillian-turned-character actor best known for playing Uncle Charlie on the 60s sitcom My Three Sons. And, sure, I guess Tilly's face has some similarity to crusty, good-natured Uncle Charlie's face. Pretty sure Wilhelmina Demarest is just meant to be a feminine form of William Demarest's name, though it turns out that his mother was, in fact, named Wilhelmina. So, who knows? Oh, and we nearly forgot to mention Harvey B. Dunn. Harvey B. Dunn, the bird-toting police captain in this movie, also played the dad in Teenagers from Outer Space, which we covered way back in episode, uh, three. And finally, Tom's candy striper outfit from the opening of the episode includes a hat that has a simple red cross on it. And that red cross, also known as the Geneva Cross, is a symbol of, you know, international aid organization, the Red Cross. And that symbol is protected in the Geneva Convention, where it's made clear that using the symbol in other contexts is absolutely forbidden. All of which is to say that this episode of MST3K is technically a war crime. (laughs) That's time. And that's cry. Yeah, it's true. Video games get into trouble all the time because everybody wants to use that as like the hospital symbol. It's like, nope, you are super not allowed to do that. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Yeah, you'll get a nasty gram right away if your video game catches anyone's attention. <laughs> well, Chris, I have to ask the question: Does anyone give two fucks for Bella? <laughs> I mean, yes, of course they do. Bella's the best part of this movie, and he gets to enjoy the best scene in this movie. Bella is a, a very charismatic actor, and uh, and and certainly, while he deserved better than just to be in Ed Wood movies, it's also great how he was used in Ed Wood movies. I mean, I care about him more because he was in Ed Wood movies. <laughs> I don't know, but that's because you haven't seen his riveting performance in White Zombie. No, this is true, but like... I, I care a lot more about Bella Lugosi because he was in Ed Wood films, right? Like, if he wants to make it an argument as to why he's better than Karloff, that's the one to go with for me. <laughs> so this has one of Bella Lugosi's finest hours in it. And uh, the Ed Wood film, the, the biopic, uh, does a really great job of highlighting this. Like, it highlights a number of moments throughout Ed Wood's films that you know, actually are quite touching and meaningful and and tries to present them in the best possible light. This one, I don't even think you need to. Like, it's such a good scene. I mean, Bella really acts up a storm with it. Well, this is Ed Wood's, I I think, best bit of writing um, is this little speech. And so what I thought it would be fun to do is for us to take a turn at being Bella. Okay. I've got the little little bit of the script in, in our notes, and I think we can take turns uh, being Vornoff and Strosky. Sure. Uh, which would you like to go first or as, 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 as Bella, or would you like me to? Oh, sure. I'll go first as Bella. Sure. All right. 
Uh, no, now let me see. I need to do. I need to do the the right uh, Russian question mark, German question mark, some Pennsylvania. I think he's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Vornov, I have searched for you everywhere. Everywhere I have heard stories of monsters. Now I am here, sent to bring you home. Home? I have no home. Hunted. Despised. Living like an animal. The jungle is my home. But I will show the world that I can be its master. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. <laughs> Very nice, very nice, very nice, very nice. All okay. Right. All right, all right. Hold on, let me get into the moment. Sure. Oh, okay, I'm in the jungle. I'm in the thing. I'm trying to create Superman. I've left Eastern Europe. I'm in the middle of... Yeah, okay. All right, go for it. Volnov, I have searched for you everywhere. Everywhere I have heard stories of monsters. Now I am here, sent to bring you home. Home? I have no home. Hunted, despised, living like an animal. The jungle is my home. But I will show the world that I can be its master. I will perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen which will conquer the world. (laughs) Yay! Oh, it's fun to do. It's fun to do. I mean, Bella did it better than we did it, but it's still fun to do. Hmm. Although I will say controversially this, I think that, you know, Bella is visibly ill in the movie at times. Sure, sure. And and I think noticeably in the speech, with I th- which I think does hurt it a little bit. Like, I don't think we do get Bella at the height of his powers. It would have been great to see Bella do this even two years prior to its filming. Because I contrast it with Martin Landau giving his best performance of his entire career as Bella when he delivers the speech. And I got to say, I think, I think Martin kind of knocked it out of the park. He did a very good job with it. He he got an Oscar for that, right? Yeah. I, the more I've seen it and the older I get, maybe I'm just more and more impressed with it. Every time I watch it, he commits to it. He absolutely commits to it. Oh, yeah. It's a brilliant performance from an actor that I have found really hit and miss in the past. Like, Bella is mostly hits, but uh, but Martin, Mar- <laughs> bad Martin Landau performance is just dire. Oh. I mean, you've seen Space 1999. Have I? Yes, Cosmic oh, Princess. Right, yes, yes. Is he in that? Yes, he's the lead. <laughs> I've absolutely forgotten that. <laughs> As well you would. It's a very forgettable performance. You know, uh, when I found out that he was originally go- up for the role of Mr. Spock, I'm so thankful that Nimoy got it instead, because Landau would have been such a bore, I think. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Martin Landau, he's um, he, he can be variable, although he's very, very fun in a movie called Alone in the Dark, where he co-stars with uh, an equally scenery-chewing performance alongside the over-the-top one he gives, uh, which is given courtesy of, you guessed it, Donald Pleasance. The Uwe Boll movie? No, no, no. 1982's Alone in the Dark, which is a lot of fun, directed by Jack Shoulder. We have to talk about the short a bit, I suppose, even if we've only got half of it so far. Ah, so I suppose we should have half the talk. I suppose so. Let's talk this time about direct sales. Do you have any experience? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I bet you do. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to rub it in your face or anything. The fact that I haven't really had to do that, it would be so disastrous. I can't imagine having to do that. I, uh, even just like cold calling people. You know what? I guess I have had a little bit of direct sales because I have done things where I was hitting people up for donations. Mm-hmm. But even that, I like dodged as much as i could yeah and donations is like a little easier to sell to your own soul if it's for a good cause than for goddamn selling things door to door which i did oh man all right so you've actually done the door to door salesman part i have i uh i was working for a company who i will not name (laughs) chevrolet (laughs) Where? Oh, no, the jig is up. Uh, Yeah, I was going door to door. And basically, the gimmick of what I was selling was this. Whatever your gas prices were valued at, at that particular month, you would be locked in for the entire 12 months. So if they go up, well, you're only paying this low price. But of course, if they go down, you're still paying the price 
even though it's much higher than what other people are paying. And I actually had, when I knocked on somebody's door, uh, both, uh, he, he, the owner of the house came out and then his son came out and, uh, and then he turned to his son and he said, don't do door to door sales. <laughs> I mean, did you say he's right? You know, I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's rough. But I mean, honestly, could you imagine trying to sell a car door to door? I just, I mean, uh, the, the, surely the appeal of getting a car, uh, is, you know, actually testing it out on the lot and seeing if it's the right car for you. Well, I think the idea was that at this point in time, people were expected to trade their cars up every few years and cars weren't changing as often. I don't know. I don't drive, but this is my understanding of how this worked. And so basically you were already test driving it. Like you had the 1938 model. So now you can buy the 1940 model and you'll get a good deal on, on, on the trade up. That's sort of like how some people treat iPhones. Yes. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. But still it it strikes me as like a huge commitment. Like cars weren't exactly cheap back then either. No. And it's just like, how, how, like how can you trust a salesman with a car? I mean, you're not even seeing it. And it's like, you're just going by uh, his word. Uh, I don't know. It just seems I I, I wouldn't trust it. I would have the, uh, the same fear that Pee Wee Herman had of that giant door to door salesman who would visit him at the playhouse. Well, we have said a lot of things about Hired, about Bride of the Monster, about the skits and sketches of this episode, about Ed Wood in general, but it's such a classic episode. I'm sure there's a million more things we could say, but we only have time for one more final fact. Adam, got anything for us? Yes. The Did you ever wonder where that octopus prop came from? <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about this, although it was reportedly stolen from a lot. Uh, I think it was just rented from a from a rental place. Well, what it came from, it came from uh, Republic Pictures. Okay, and it originates from a 1948 John Wayne movie, which is called Wake of the Red Witch, which I believe was Dario Argento's original title for Suspiria. <laughs> <laughs> wake of the red witch yeah 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 it's uh it's it's just a seafaring movie so naturally there's an octopus in it but yeah i i i just thought uh, that was such a great title that it was worth uh bringing up and also that uh you always hear about the stolen octopus but uh, never where it's from and sure enough i guess it's a famous octopus because it co-starred with the duke huh do you know where the uh, stock footage came from? <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful world of B4 color. No, I have no idea. I don't know either. Gig Young. Gig Young is in this, wasn't he in something? No, he's not. He's in other Gig Young we but... talked about. Did I we know talk we... about it? We definitely did. Yeah. I know there's a shallow 13 about Gig Young. It's weird as that as much as I, as much as my memory goes from podcast to podcast, it's like, oh no, there's a shallow 13 about Gig Young somewhere. Deadly Mantis? Is he in that? There is. Crow comments that one of the Air Force Day players looks like Gig Young. Yeah. Damn. (laughs) All right. That was a not that was a long time ago that we did that episode. But it's not often you forget a name like Gig. That's true. It's short for Giggles. (laughs) Dr. Giggles. MD. Medical Deviant. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you were ever betrothed to a monster, or if you'd like to ask us anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, and we're on Twitter at it is just a show. We'd love to hear from you. This show is made possible by listeners like you. For as little as $1 an episode, you can help us research and record this show, and you can listen to all our superfan bonus bits. Find out more at itsjustashow.com slash Patreon, or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And thank you if you do. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 99... Whoa! That seems like an awfully suspicious-looking number. Yeah, you know, I, I, what could we possibly follow up episode four twenty-three with? I, I mean, you know, uh, I'm searching, but uh, oh, I, I feel like Columbo. My mind is racing, but I can't piece it together.
Well, it's uh, Labor Day, so I think we have to do a Hercules movie, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You, you heard it here first. Episode 100, some Hercules movie. <laughs> Episode 100, some Hercules movie, or maybe one of the most Herculean movies ever encountered on this show, Manos, the Hands of Fate. Ooh, 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 ooh. Poodle bites, poodle chews. This will be great. Episode one zero zero. I can't believe we made it this far. This is crazy. We are now officially in the triple digits and still alive. Yeah, despite everything, despite the fact that the world has tried to kill us, despite the haters, we have been hunted, despised. Gosh, man, it's the hands of fate. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, what can you say? We better figure out something. Yeah, otherwise it's just going to be dead silence and be like, hey, episode's good. It would be funny if it was just an hour-long silence. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good episode, this next one we're going to do. Yeah, spoilers. <laughs> oh, also, it's got a short attached to it called Hired Part 2. So yes. if you were concerned about where that plot line was going, well, you'll find out soon enough. I believe they refer to it as the stirring conclusion to Hired. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that I say every time I watch an MST3K. Uh, whenever I get to the final commercial break, before it comes back on for that last little bit of movie, I say, and now the stirring conclusion of Bride of the Monster. It's an immensely quotable episode. Uh, this is uh, this is you know considered by many to be the high point of the series, and uh, I I you know again spoilers. I would agree. This is one of one of the best episodes of the show. Yeah, I don't think that's too controversial. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not going to I'm not going to get uh, uh, any hate for my hot take on this one. Yeah, exactly. Just just going to let you know ahead of time. This is a very good episode we're about to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have I told you about my 5-year plan? <laughs> We're just going to be telling the jokes from it back and forth to each other for an hour. That's all anybody's ever wanted this podcast to be. And we're finally going to give it to them. I'm sorry. I must seem unappealing to you now. <laughs> oh, Joel, this is a snuff film, isn't it? <laughs> Why does every frame look like someone's last known photo? I love that joke. That is my favorite joke of the whole episode. Oh, that's really... I mean, I love the five-year plan bit, but that joke is also... I mean, there's so many good jokes. Yeah, they're they're firing all, on all cylinders for this one, probably because it was so tough to do. It's it's the most punishing, well, one of the most punishing movies they ever watched, and thank God they did because they they really got a lot of entertainment out of a truly truly terrible movie. All right, well, I think we just need to start recording it immediately. We don't need to rewatch it. Let's go. <laughs> this time we watch season four, episode twenty four, Manos, the Hands of Fate. I take care of the podcast while the editor's away. <laughs> All right. But until then, pull the string. Oh, wait, that's the wrong Ed Wood movie. Time for go to. No, that's the wrong Lobo movie. Take it away, theme squad. octopus is better than your grandma.